welcome to Wonderlust, my video blog about Forrest Fenn and the thrill of the chase and hunt for his hidden treasure. So today I want to parse the Moby Dickens Bookshop, Taos, New Mexico uh, bookstore interview. This was on November 2nd, 2013. So I'm just going to jump right in. We're going to listen to this. Uh, I may put up some uh, pictures here also. See if I can get this up here, this picture. So yeah, here's the uh, St. Mary Visitor Center webcam. So kind of may switch between some of these pictures and they do click off. So let's listen to Forrest Fenn. And I got to replay this back a little bit. And uh, we'll get this started. So yeah, I cut off the beginning. There's some introductions and... Let's get started listening to Forrest Fan at the Moby Dickens Bookshop in Taos, New Mexico. Story. Is there anyone here that knows about the story? <laughs> Who in this room has not heard about my treasure story? Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> well, uh, in 1988, I had cancer and they told me I was going to die. <coughs> that's a good way to start off a talk. They gave me a one in five chance of living three years. And so I got to go back, and he's done this before. He always kind of opens with it. Um, let's listen to this one more time. I'm going to rewind this. All right, let's listen again. In 1988, I had cancer, and they told me I was going to die. <coughs> That's a good way to start off a talk. They gave me a one in five chance of living three years. And a lot of things were happening about that time. I was selling my gallery in Santa Fe and and I had a... So I think that's interesting. Again, interesting, that he always opens, not always, but he hits those numbers. It's 1988. I had a one in five chance. I think in the er same interviews in 2013, he says 20%. Uh, one in five is 20%. But my point, and I made those in the earlier video, is that he throws these numbers out. Let's listen to some more and see if he throws out some more numbers. A lot of clients that were coming to see me to, to do different things, and it just so happened that Ralph Lauren came to my house. He collects antique Indian things like I did. And he didn't know that I had cancer. But we were standing in my in my library, and I had something that he wanted. It was a beautiful Sioux Indian bonnet with white ermine hang, uh, skins hanging on it and split antelope horns, and it was a wonderful thing, and he wanted to buy it. And I said, well, I don't want to sell it. And he said, well, you have so many of those things. He said, you can't take it with you. I said, well, then I'm not going. <laughs> and, and we laughed and changed the subject. But that night I started thinking about that. Who says I can't take it with me? Why do I have to live by everybody else's rules? If I'm going to die of cancer, I'm going to take some stuff with me. And I made up my mind. So I bought this beautiful little treasure chest, 10 inches by 10 inches and 6 inches high. Wonderful Romanesque thing. An antique scholar told me that it was probably Romanesque, 11th or 12th century. Maybe it held a Bible or a book of days. So that is interesting. 10 inches by 10 inches by 6 inches. I have to check the records, but I think he may have just slipped. But I believe it's 10 by 10 by 5. I also like the information that he says that it's probably 11th century and may have held a Bible for what it's worth. Let's listen more. But it was one, wonderful. Had a great patina on it. And I started filling it up with, with things that I thought would be attractive. There are 265 gold coins, American, mostly eagles and double eagles. Uh, there are some Middle Eastern gold coins that date to the 13th century. There's a little bottle of gold dust in there, and there, there are hundreds and hundreds of gold nuggets mostly from Alaska, placer nuggets. Two of them are so large that, that they're the same size as a, as a hen's egg. They weigh more than a pound apiece. And in this chest, I put hundreds of 
rubies. There are two beautiful Ceylon sapphires. There are eight emeralds, lots of little diamonds, uh, pre-Columbian wakas, uh, 2,000 year old bracelets and a Tyrona and Sinu necklace that dates probably 2,500 years old. The fetishes on the necklace are made out of quartz crystal and carnelian and semi-precious stones. And it, I told myself I wanted it to be visual enough so that when a person found the treasure chest and opened it for the first time, they would just lean back and start laughing. And I've showed the chest to a number of people in Santa Fe and, and that's what they all did. So I think it's interesting that in these earlier interviews where he first starts pitching the book, there's the April interview in 2013, I believe the October interview, and now there's this November interview here at the Moby Dickens bookshop in Taos, New Mexico. And he vividly describes the contents of the box. And I think that is very interesting. And in subsequent old, later videos, in the interviews, I have to inspect that. And I'm going to go through, and that was the whole point of me parsing these videos is that of the interviews with Forrest Fenn, is that I kind of want to parse out and hear, there's so much like secondhand information if you go on threads, and I'm, I've done that before too, is I've said, well, Forrest Fenn said what? He said this. And then someone will say, well, if you go back to the video, he didn't say that exactly. And that's one of the reasons why I like parsing these videos. Now, it is very interesting that in this video he goes and says the contents and he goes into very exact information about it and it almost reminds me as though he just looked at it this morning. And I mean, that's just me being suspicious, but it is weird that he has such a perfect recollection of it as though he may have just seen it recently. Take that for what it's worth. Let's move on. So, uh, so I invite you to go look for the treasure chest. And my, my plan was to, uh, if I was going to die of cancer, uh, I think they said I had a one in five chance of living three years. So that told me I had a year, probably, anyway. So uh, I decided, I knew where I was going to hide the treasure chest. And I told myself, <coughs> with my last gasping breath, I was going to go out there and fling myself on top of that treasure chest and let, let my bones go back to the, to the dirt. It was a great plan. The trouble with it was I got well. <laughs> and it ruined the story. But I told myself, just because I got well didn't mean that I could, could not hide the treasure chest anyway. And I did. The last part of, the thing of that is kind of interesting is he says that it ruined the story. I still find that kind of, you know, if you're really trying to parse out clues, it ruined the story of what? And I know a lot of people make, and they make comments about that, and they want to parse it more and more about that he found a spot and he put the chest out there and he wanted to fling his body down and let his bones go back to the earth. So a question that I have is, is that like a euphemism? Is he just saying that as a matter of fact, Lee, as you would say, you know, I would, you know, if I won the lottery, I would crap myself or, you know, wet, I'd wet myself or whatever, you know, something like that. You know, would you really? No, you wouldn't. You're just saying that as a matter of fact. So I wonder if he's saying, I would throw myself down there, let my bones go back to the earth. Is sort of a matter of fact does he really mean that he's going to do that? I think, again, it's along those lines. And so whenever people say, well, the chest couldn't be someplace that a body would be rotting, but he never said that. I mean, he said this kind of euphemistic statement. So I still take that with a grain of salt when people say, well, you couldn't, the, the box couldn't be in downtown Santa Fe somewhere because you wouldn't want to have a rotten body down there. And I, I think that that's a folly. That's another mistake that like searchers do. Let's listen some more. There's a in my book, The Thrill of the Chase. There's a poem in there that has nine clues in it. If you can follow the clues to the treasure chest, you can have the treasure chest. And uh, I thought about that a lot. And when I 
when I, when I took when I hid the treasure chest, I had to make two trips because the thing weighs 42 pounds. It's small, but it's gold is heavy. And and when I hid it and was walking back to my car, I started laughing out loud. And I said, Forrest Finn, did you really do that? So this is definitely a famous piece of information in famous in regards to the thrill of the chase and anybody who's looking for the chest so it bears listening to one more time hold on let me rewind this let's listen one more time so i got well <laughs> and I ruined the story but i told myself just because i got well didn't mean that i could, could not hide the treasure chest anyway and i did that and there's a in my book the thrill of the chase there's a poem in there that has nine clues in it if you can follow the clues to the treasure chest, you can have the treasure chest. And uh, I thought about that a lot. And when I, when, I, when, I took, when I hid the treasure chest, I had to make two trips because the thing weighs 42 pounds. It's small, but it's gold is heavy. And, and when I hid it and was walking back to my car, I started laughing out loud. And I said, Forrest Finn, did you really do that? Okay, so there is the two trips to the car statement that, and the laughing on his way back to the car, did you really do that statement? So let's listen some more. But it's worth hearing again that about the 42 pounds and the weight of it and the two trips. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I had a whole card. I told myself if I, if I decide later I didn't want to do it, I could go back and get it. But the more I thought about it, the more I said, yeah, this, this is perfect. Why, why can't I influence somebody a thousand years from now, a hundred years from now? Okay, next weekend. <laughs> if you can find it, I think it'll be worth your while. A lady reporter from Texas called me on the phone and she said, Mr. Finn, who is your audience for this strange book? I said, my audience is every redneck in Texas with a pickup truck, <laughs> a wife and 12 kids. He lost his job. I said, throw a bedroll in your back of your truck and go look for the treasure chest and take the kids. Get so here is the redneck comment once again. Uh, he did that in the earlier interviews. Uh, it went from eight kids to 12. In the earlier interviews, he said a redneck from Texas who lost his job and has eight kids. And this time it's 12 kids. And he parses the story a little bit, something about throw the bedroll in the back. Um, let's listen some more. Get the kids out of the game room, away from their little playing machines, and let them breathe the sunshine and the things that the forest has to offer. A wonderful opportunity. And I, just this last week, passed 25,000 emails from people. I also think it's funny that he, when he talks about the children, he says, let the children breathe the sunshine. I think that's just a Forrest Venn-ism, and I notice when anybody talks, they all have their own little variances in the way they speak. Even I have my own issues where I kind of stop mid-sentence, and but that is definitely a Forrest Venn-ism, and I don't know if he did that deliberately, but uh, let the kids breathe the sunshine in. Let's listen some more. And probably 15,000 of them have told me, Mr. Finn, we're not going to find the chest. We know that. But I want to thank you for getting me and my kids off the couch and out into the truck. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I could go on and on, but I don't want to talk too much. I would entertain some questions if anybody has one. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video right there, at least this part one because I believe the rest of it, he kind of does this Q&A back and forth and then sort of interview-ish thing. And it gets more and more interesting. That definitely was his intro. And he kind of hits on his little storylines about the getting the kids off the couch. And I don't even remember if he mentions the wife in that clip. Anyways, uh, this is part one of parsing the force fan at Moby Dickens bookshop in Taos, New Mexico on October 2nd, 2013. Like my video, leave a comment. Thank you for tuning in. No, no, notorious.